Government Office for Science uh, supports the government's chief scientific advisor, Professor Sir John Beddington, uh, in his role to provide advice to Prime Minister and Cabinet. I'm on secondment here from um, the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, which is part of the Ministry of Defence, and I head up John's area looking at defence and security, but are very closely linked with the civil contingencies and health and biotechnology agenda as well. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with key government departments in that domain, so talking to the Ministry of Defence and the Home Office, for example, on counter-terrorism. But we also very, work very closely with the Cabinet Office to ensure that science advice in emergencies, for example, is, is embedded into the systems that the government uses. We secretariat something called SAGE, which is the Science Advisory Group in Emergencies, which Sir John generally chairs, which provides advice up into COBRA during emergencies, for example, in Fukushima, etc. Um, and we also ensure that we put mechanisms and communication routes in place to ensure we can get access to the science advice that we need should anything happen. So it's a mixture between working with government departments on issues like cyber security, um, all the way through to um, dropping everything when, uh, when an emergency happens and working with Sir John and ministers to, on the UK response to that incident. I've been here about um, two and a half years now. Um, when I first arrived, about three months after I arrived, swine flu happened. So uh, we got very involved in um, predicting or trying to predict what, the, what would happen with swine flu and working with Department of Health on their response to pandemic influenza uh, trying to understand what the early signs coming out of places like Mexico meant and providing advice into, into the government and into cabinet on, on, on those types of issues. More, a year later, pretty much to the day, we had um, Eifige Jekyll in Iceland um, go bang, um, which caused, some, uh, uh, caused us quite a lot of work with the Department of Transport and others to, to work out how um, airlines could operate, for example, in ash clouds and working through some of the quite complex issues there. Um, a year later, uh, Fukushima and uh, Grimsfjorden, another Icelandic volcano, went off. And obviously the tsunami and the um, uh, earthquake and the, the corresponding, or the, the resultant nuclear incident in Fukushima uh, was another area that we were heavily involved. So in each of those cases, we called together a sage of a range of experts appropriate to the emergency and provide advice up to uh, ministers and into COBRA on um, a scientific component of their decision making to, uh, to respond to those events. Well, science advice is only one stream of advice that goes into the decision makers in those kind of situations. Um, there are obviously a, a, a number of other streams of information that are important and factors that need to be taken into account, public perception, uh, public risk, cost uh, and, and a load of a, a number of other factors um, and the relative weight of those various information streams will vary depending on the situation that, that you're in and what the question that's been asked is. Yes, I mean communication is, is a key, key thing. Um, being open about um, your decision-making process and, and the factors that you've used as part of that is, is very important. Um, being open and honest about, um, for example, the uncertainties in the scientific advice is very important. However, trying to explain those uncertainties and what they mean is quite, quite, can be quite challenging. Obviously, as decisions are being made, there is some level of... Um, there's some need to be a bit more careful about what exactly you can say before those decisions are made. So, for example, all the SAGE minutes are published online um, following the event. And um, during Fukushima, we uh, published synopses of the meetings um, during the emergency itself. So um, we were keen to get the information out there. But the media is obviously a key factor there and ensuring that the media gives a balanced view of, of the situation is quite important. Scientists um, uh, sometimes are not the best people at, at communicating ideas and information across to non-technical non people. Science, as you're well aware, is 
is often very uh, shorthand or very specific um, uh, vocabulary that people use amongst themselves within academia or within science to explain things. And trying to explain quite technical, challenging ideas to people who are not versed in the subject can be quite a challenge. So I think that's something that scientists need to work on. Science communication is a real key, uh, key factor and being able to explain the value that science gives you and, and, and what science can and cannot do for you is quite an important thing. And you need to do that in terms that the people that you're talking to can understand, your audience can understand. Uncertainty is also one of the big factors that we, we, we work very hard with. Um, people, a lot of people seem to think science is black and white and they don't necessarily realise that there's sh lots of shades of grey and lots of uncertainty in, in pretty much all areas of science. So to our, trying to explain a situation and including that, the uncertainty that's intrinsic with that scientific understanding is quite an important and challenging one. But it's not a one-way street. We need to get, for example, the policy makers to be able to understand scientists and be able to communicate to scientists so that the scientists can understand what their questions are. So there needs to be a dialogue there to be able to, so policy makers can, say, can articulate their problems and then scientists can help them understand what science can and cannot do to help solve those problems. So I think it's a bit of a two-way thing. Um, and there's certainly um, scope for, for example, people who don't have a technical background to have some structured way of, of getting to understand what science is a little bit about. Obviously, you'll, you won't get the details. It's a very broad and, and, and challenging area. But to understand how science works, how it plugs together, what the areas are and, and, and what it can and cannot do, I think, are very important. So there's a bit of education on both sides, I think, to try and get that communication to work properly. And I think places like this, where we work on that science policy interface in this situation, but many others where they work on an interface between science and non-science area, is very important, um, have a very important role to play. And things like the, the, the Cambridge Science Policy Fellowships are a, another useful mechanism for people to get that conversation started.